Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Let's have a look how we do it. Yeah, that's good. Welcome back, everyone. My name's Paul. I'm brand new to investing, and I've started a dividend reinvestment portfolio here on Trading212. And I've got to admit, I've got a bit of a problem. You see, I checked my dividend growth the other day because this is a dividend growth portfolio where I reinvest the dividends. I use those dividends to buy new shares, which bring in more dividend. That's the idea of dividend compounding. And in 10 to 15 years, I should, in theory, have quite a large reinvestment portfolio with a lot of cash in it. But I came to look at my 2021 dividend growth and I was a bit confused, if I'm honest. You see, it is kind of doing what it's doing. In 2020, I earned 205 pounds in dividends. And in 2021, I earned 780 pounds in dividends. But in 2022, I don't seem to be gaining that much traction. And here on the graph, you can see it started to tail back a bit. In March 2022, I earned £35 pounds in dividends. But in March 2021, I still earned £30. Pounds. I thought there would be a lot more of a difference there. Either way, according to this exponential trend line, we are still in an upward trend. But it just doesn't feel like it's going as fast as I want it to. So I had a look for the cause and uh, I looked through to see if any of my companies had stopped paying dividends. And, and it seems that only Walt Disney is the only one that's left that hasn't reinstated its dividends so far. All the rest seem to have either grown their dividend quite significantly or they have paid special dividends because they did so well last year. So why the fuck aren't my dividends growing? And then it twigged. And this is something I think I've been doing unconsciously. You see, 2020 was a bit of an amazing year for the stock market. Loads of growth and speculative stocks all went to the absolute moon. I was watching this all as it happened and I did my best to avoid getting into any of that hype. I was pretty convinced that eventually all the SPACs were going to come back down to earth. And in 2021, that's kind of what's happened. A lot of the big darlings of 2020 have absolutely collapsed back down to where they were previously, or even worse, just, I don't know, some just disappeared. And that was complete luck. I didn't know they were going to do that. I didn't have a magical crystal ball. It was just a guess, a hunch, if you will. Although I suppose you only just have to look at your math to realize he's absolutely full of shit. But midway through 2021, we had this massive pivot. Jamath just disappeared and Kathy Wood became the queen of bag holding. And all the money started to shift away from these growth stocks and into much more safe stocks. I've done pretty well out of this with BAE Systems now at 50%. We've got Raytheon Technologies again at 50% up. We've got Rio Tinto 30% up, Seagrow 53% up, and uh, Tyson Foods, one of my absolute favorite stocks at 45% up. It's not all been rosy. One of my favorite stocks, Lenar, is down 14%, all because of interest rates. So it's not brilliant, but this is why we have diversified portfolios. But I have a rule. When everybody likes these stocks, it's time to stop buying them. And then I should go out and find all of the stocks that nobody's buying. In 2021, I had a look through and I only really found two that I liked. One was Discovery, which is now part of the Warner Bros. Discovery merger. I had a mini plan here to buy as much AT&T as I could to reap the dividend and then have it convert into Warner Bros. Discovery when the eventual date came around. The risk there was that the uh, merger wasn't actually going to happen or it collapsed or something. Um, since then, it's done very, very well. I think it's around 9% up at the moment. AT&T hasn't done too bad either that's currently six percent up after the merger and uh, warner brothers discovery after the merger is uh, 4.87 percent up whether it'll stay like that i don't know nobody knows but the other company that i really liked was google or alphabet and i spent a significant amount of money in this company i've put around one quarter of my total 2021 isa allowance into google and that might be why my dividend yield hasn't gone up because these two companies don't pay a dividend. And when you're not reinvesting into the companies that pay dividends, you're not going to recoup the dividends back from those companies. My strategy isn't all about growing these dividends though. It's not the sole focus. It's just a nice thing to see. So I would like to eventually get this back on track. 
And that's what I'm probably going to do for 2022. I've rearranged this whole graph now to show a bit of more of an exponential curve and I've got it a bit more set up so I can track my year on year dividend growth as well. I've also set up a second sheet now which tracks my portfolio's progress against my portfolio inside VUSA. Trading 212 has kind of messed up the Warner Brothers Discovery merger, so it doesn't reflect a proper return on Warner Brothers Discovery. No, I'm not 10,000% up on Warner Brothers. So this will now be an additional feature that you'll see coming to this channel, and I'll update this basically whenever I can. I have to do this manually. I have no experience in Excel. This is just something I'm going to do whenever I remember to do it. So today it's April 2022. Current portfolio progress with VUSA is 16.05%. And my total return so far, I had this prepared earlier, is 18.656%. And you can see we've uh, dropped off recently because of the scares of the recession and the recent interest rate rises, uh, but I'm still slightly ahead of the S&P 500. Only slightly. I can see this going badly next year. But I wanna change this dividend thing. I think during a recession, dividend investment companies or dividend growth companies generally have high cash flows and are businesses that transcend recessions. So many of these companies that have a long history of paying dividends and growing those dividends are very likely to come out of the other side of a very hostile environment perfectly fine. That's the theory and it's done me okay so far. It's the one I'm sticking to. But I wanna grow my dividend income and I wanna put my money into companies that I think are going to make a big difference in the future. And that's why the first stock that I'm buying for my ISA in 2022 is ASML. Quincy oil. And Quincy oil. You're more than welcome to take. ASML, never heard of it? Good. ASML is one of the most important companies in the world. In the world. That's not from me. Everyone else says that. I think it's it's interesting that we've got a company that isn't sort of top of our headlines that comes from Eindhoven where few people sort of go or recognize as a, as a hub of technology and innovation. And I think ASML is, is so foundational to the continuation of lots of the elements of change we've been talking about. So whether that's healthcare and Moderna, whether that's indeed AWS itself or some of the e-commerce companies or what we're seeing in China, it's played an absolutely critical role in allowing the continuation of um, Moore's law through the development of EEV technology. I was actually trumped by an American fund manager I admire recently who was listening to one of his uh, podcasts. He said that actually he thought ASML was responsible for most of human progress over the last 30 years. Everyone everywhere is looking at Tesla, Nvidia, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Samsung, TSMC and Intel. It doesn't matter which ethos of investing you're looking at, you're all looking at one thing, semiconductors. These little tiny chips are imperative to the future of humanity. And while a few companies like Apple, Google, and Tesla build their own little chips, most of the main big semiconductors come from three different companies, TSMC, Intel, and Samsung. These three companies have these massive fab warehouses. There's more being built by Intel in Arizona and TSMC is building loads in the US as well. But none of them can do anything without one of these bad boys. Yes, ASML's EUV lithography machines. They kind of look like a locker room at your local swim baths. You know those ones with the little magnetic clippy things and you open the doors and they barely look like they've got doors? ASML make them. As usual, this is technology that's way above my pay grade. But what I do know is one of these costs around $150 million. They have a 30% markup on these and they're the only place in the world that make them. ASML is one of the two or three real monopolies in the world. But ASML has spent around two decades developing this new EUV lithography system, Extreme Ultraviolet. And over the past two years, ASML and the other chip makers have kind of proven that EUV is the only way to go to get the best chips out there. Now this technology is completely proven, I feel like it's time to invest. I've been on ASML for a while now. It's uh, been a bit of a bane in my existence. I had the chance to invest in it here down at $279. Um, I can't believe I missed it. Uh, I'm, I'm gutted. 
I'm absolutely gutted. But as investors, what I shouldn't be doing is anchoring. And when I've got a company that grows its dividend, some years it's grown its dividend by 90%. And when I've got a company that has a massive moat, SML is literally the only company that can make these machines. Even the Chinese cannot copy this. In fact, the Americans have banned them from selling any secondhand ones to the Chinese to stop them from getting this technology. When you've got systems like this in place, it feels like this is a company where valuation largely shouldn't matter. But in my opinion, valuation does matter. So let's see what we've got. Now, looking at this from a broad timeline of over 25 years, uh, it looks like ASML is vastly overvalued. However, this doesn't signify any form of growth rate right now. So let's bring the details down a bit and we start to get a bit more of a growth rate. So if we break it down to only 10 years, we now have a 15% growth rate. Now, if I look through Fungrass, we can look at ASML's 10-year earnings growth rate at 10.62%. And we can look at the five-year earnings growth rate, which bounces up nicely to 33%. I think somewhere in between these two is most likely. I'm going to be safe and I'm going to call this around 15 to 17% growth. That's what I hope for going forward. This is double digit growth. It's not quite Google growth, but considering the moat and considering the properties that they've got, I'm thinking optimistically it's going to be on the higher side of that. But to be conservative and be a bit safer, I think we've got loads of room to play with. So I'm going to put this around 15% growth expected in the future. While we're here, we'll look through a couple of the other important parts to a business, like basic shares outstanding. Over the past 10 years, ASML has been buying back its shares. This is a company that's directly giving back tax-free cash to its shareholders. Sales and revenue growth is growing by 10% over the past 10 years, and obviously 23% over the past five years. Total debt is growing, but it's got a lot of capital expenditures. It literally sells probably five of these products a year, I think it's around five or six products of these, six of these a year. It takes two jumbo jets to get them to where they've got to go. Uh, these are big ass machines and they're expensive at $150 million a piece. You kind of expect it to be that price when it's driving humanity forward. Return on invested capital was uh, 33 times, but it regularly sits at a 19 double digit. Uh, it regularly sits well in the double digits of return on invested capital. This is one of the important me metrics run by Terry Smith, and I think it's a pretty good indicator as well. Another awesome thing, which I don't pay enough attention to with some of these companies, is that the net margin is growing. That means they're making more and more money every year off these machines. That's either by reducing capital expenditure, by making their manufacturing process more economical or just charging the fuck out of Intel and all that. And I also look at the current ratio. The current ratio has dropped over the past 10 years, but it's still 1.48. It still has much more money, cash in its pocket to pay for all of its debt, all of its dividends and all of its liabilities. No matter what, I think you're always going to pay a proper premium for ASML. I wasn't willing to pay 59 times earnings right at the peak, but I was looking at it more around the 28 mark during the COVID crash. It's now recently dropped down to a PE of 36, so it's getting a little bit more favorable and I really don't want to miss out on good value on ASML. According to this long fast graph right now, it's very possible that if it doesn't meet earnings over the next four or five years, we could lose 4.8% a year from ASML. However, if I bring the graph forward and I make the growth rate 29%, which is kind of on the higher end of what people believe ASML is going to achieve over the next five years, we actually find that the current price is now only 29 times earnings. Do we think that in five years, ASML is going to be 29 times earnings? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I can't tell you how this is going to go in the future. But considering it's 36 times earnings now, 29 times earnings in the future will earn you an 8.8% growth rate. Considering that the S&P 500 is forecast to only make 4% over the next 10 years, that's a pretty good return. So next I bring it into the forecast calculator to try and get a bit more of a detailed view on this. And it's actually pretty good news. I've got the growth rate set at the average analyst estimate. Over the next five years, analysts believe on average that ASML will grow its earnings by 15.23%. And if ASML keeps that up, and I kind of think that's on the conservative side, if it has a PE contraction down to 15, we will gain only 0.54%. 
It's largely saved by the little bit of dividend that they're going to pay you over the next five years. And I think that's based on dividends growing at around 15 to 25%. Basically, if this company grows its dividend consistently by 20% and has the cash flows to do that, it's not going to contract in PE. That's kind of how the market works. However, if the company is one of those big companies, one of those world saving, life changing companies, these might always trade at a price to earnings ratio of over 20. So if we accept that ASML still has in 2027, a PE ratio of 22, we will then see a gain of 7.41% per year. I think that's a pretty good return considering the world that we're about to step into. And I've started this position very small with only one share. That's because I'm not entirely sure that this price is going to go up. I honestly feel that this share price could dip all the way down to the low 450 mark before it starts to recover. And I've simply bought one share right now because I'm going to try to dollar cost average into this. I don't know where the bottom of this correction is going to be. It could be here right now. It could be at 300 for all we know. So I'm not willing to take a risk and put all my money in at five, $600. If it goes up, I'll keep adding in. But every single month, I'm probably gonna add in quarter of a share, half a share, and just let this thing ride a little bit. I do feel that in 2024, it's gonna be more like $750, which is an increase on what it is right now. But what we're doing is we're moderating the spending and I'm dollar cost averaging into everything to make sure that I don't miss the bottom. All this while, I'm going to be reaping that dividend. It's only a small dividend. It's about 1% at the moment. I'm not here for the dividend income in the early stages. I'm here for the high cash flow and the dedication to the dividend and the dividend growth. It's very hard to sort of describe the difference sometimes. But in 2022, I've decided to be much more dedicated to my dividend growth again. I've made one last speculative buy uh, and I'll go into that probably next week. But after that, I'm back to dividend growth. 